but I'm going to invite the audience to actually converse about what it is that they're excited about peer-to-peer, -peer, and I'm sure the points that I've come to, to make will show up in that conversation. Come on. Come on up. Great. We've got one. We need one more. So I'm actually going to, I'll do a quick introduction of myself, uh, and then we'll just dive into some conversations. Does that sound okay? All right, so my name is Matthew Schutte, uh, and I'll try to obey their instructions. I'm supposed to stay seated over here. <laughs> uh, my name is Matthew Schutte. I work on a project called Holochain. How many of you have heard of Holochain? A few? Great. Uh, Holochain is a, a, a protocol, a, a, a pattern, really, for building and running peer-to-peer -peer applications, so applications that don't require any re web servers, no centralized servers, which basically means you don't have to have a company with a business model in the middle in order for people to be able to communicate about whatever it is that they want to communicate about, whether that's a Twitter-like app or booking ride shares or homestays or anything along those lines. Uh, the talk that, we're, that I'm scheduled to do today has to do with the advantages of peer-to-peer, -peer, but I want to start out by asking the folks who've sat down, what is it that you are excited about with peer-to-peer? -peer? Why, why did you come today? What, what are you curious about? What are you most excited about? What draws you to this? And you can say your name and, and then uh, share whatever comes to you. Okay, so uh, hello, I'm Alex. Um, I'm very interested in peer-to-peer -peer applications in general. Today I came especially uh, for Holochain because I already know a little bit of the project and it's very interesting to me. Um, I, I think it's um, a very robust um, approach to solving some, some problems that we have with information today. I'm passionate about uh, open source technologies and um, kind of the ownership of your data. And um, that's why I feel peer-to-peer -peer technologies have a very interesting uh, place to, to play in this, uh, in this ecosystem. And um, one of the applications that, is very, that I'm very interested uh, um, about is peer-to-peer um, -peer decentralized identity. How to, and I think Holochain can, um, can give a new approach to this, uh, and that's something that we, I would like to, to touch upon, if, if possible. Wonderful, thank you. I'm Fabian. Um, I follow Holochain since maybe two years now. Um, I know Jean-Francois Nouvel. Uh, he told me about it a few times, so I said, okay, maybe I have to check about it. Um, and... I was really amazed by the power that it seems to be able to to give us. Um, I try to to learn about it, how to develop uh, in Rust, which is very difficult for me, but I try it to understand more inside and to see if there is a point that that can make it. I don't know, crash or I didn't find yet that not yet. <laughs> yeah, and um, also uh, I buy Holoport. I didn't receive yet, but I th I think soon it should be on the way if you yeah. if you've responded to the email. Um, and my my question is more about um, data, personal data, and privacy things like this, and authentication or anything like this. Great. Um, so. We'll just dive into a couple of the things that you, you've both touched on there. So I, I heard, and I'm going to, we will dive into Holochain in parts, I'm sure we'll get there. But I really am hoping to have this conversation be a little bit more about peer-to-peer -peer systems in general. Um, in part because the, the theory that underpins Holochain has to do with some advantages that come out of peer-to-peer -peer systems. And... Um, but I don't think the technology alone is going to solve this for us. So I, I think it's really important that we, we wrap our heads around, OK, what are the capacities that we gain? Um, because there are some costs. There are some consequences of, of adopting peer-to-peer -peer approaches. 
Uh, and so if we're not clear on what the advantages are, then we, we may not be able to make use of those. Uh, I heard ownership um, in terms of identity and personal data. I heard interest in privacy. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll comment on with regard to identity, uh, I believe that people get identity wrong <laughs> regularly. Like we, we think about identity as if we're looking for a number that attaches to a body. Uh, and we're looking for the perfect system for helping us attach numbers to bodies without having that become easily abused and result in all kinds of awful outcomes for humans. Um, but I think that's sort of a, a, an incorporation of a particular identity approach that governments have used over the past century or so that, um, that actually doesn't map to what identity really is. Identity is a social process. It's not who are you in general, it's who are you to me, right? And who you are to me is going to affect how I interact with you. So if, if I know that you fixed my friend's car and you fixed another person's car and you're good at fixing cars, if, if those are things I'm aware of about you, I may be willing to bring you my car. That's different from there being some number in, the, in a database somewhere that has facts that are accumulated about you. Uh, and my belief is actually that the places where we will see, the applications where we'll see identity emerge, like really interesting new vibrant patterns for peer-to-peer -peer identification and coordination are actually not in the identity space. I think it's going to be in the supply chain space. And partly that's because the organizations that pay for identity systems and services tend to be governments or institutions who are regulated by governments. And all of those entities basically think about identity as bodies because the, in, the, the power that a government is able to wield has to do with its ability to wield violence against a body, right? And that's, that's a thing. And so governments and even banks and insurance companies, they all think about identity as is that the right body? Should we let that body cross the border? Should we throw that body in jail? <laughs> Should we let that body open a bank account? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that very quickly pigeonholes them back into trying to, to distinguish, is this body the, the right body? Whereas when you start making use of more peer-to-peer -peer systems, you actually start enabling really rich patterns of coordination that don't necessarily just have to do with bodies. And in, it turns out you have to solve all the exact same problems when you're dealing with parts that are going into a car or produce moving across international boundaries and trying to figure out, hey, was this organic? Was it fair trade? Uh, what were the working conditions like, et cetera, et cetera. You actually have to do all the same types of things, but you're not wedded to What's the number for that thing? Especially when you're talking about assembled goods where it's coming together and breaking apart and being transformed every step of the way. Um, so yeah. can, I, can I ask you something? Do you mean that every, um, every services will have different identity for the same person? Uh, Yes, I really do. I mean, there's, there, we are building some, in, within the Holochain community, we're building uh, some services that make key management easy. Uh, and so that can be used as sort of a hook when you want to expose to someone else a portion of your history. You know, you want to share your work history or you want to share your relationship with you know, a particular university or an employer or a friend, uh, we're making it so that you can expose that, uh, but there being one single name or number to represent you, I think is a really problematic approach. 
because it, it undermines our agency, our ability to, to control what bits of our past we expose to others. And um, for a while I was trying to figure out how, how it is that reputation really works. And it turned, my hunch here, and I could be wrong, but my, my hunch after a long time thinking about this, is that the way reputation really works is that you know something about someone. So I might not know you, but I know uh, Sciences Po. I don't know them, but I know of them, Sciences Po. And, oh, you have a degree from Sciences Po? Oh, very interesting, right? Th that makes me more likely to give you an interview. And so it's the leveraging of existing relationship that, that is really how reputation always has worked. And I think that the modern era with eBay and Amazon, us seeing five-star ratings from people that we don't know, really sort of throws us off the trail when it comes to thinking about reputation and identity. So I'll touch on the... And if anybody else wants to join in, please come on up. But I'll touch on the, the main advantages that I hear people talk about when they are discussing peer-to-peer -peer systems. One is sort of data ownership, right? control over how you're going to show up in the world, who's going to get to know things about you. So that's an important one. Another is uh, security. Uh, the data ownership stuff has to do with privacy as well. Another is agency. But I, I have a slightly unusual take on this, and that is that I believe that the real key advantage and the thing that's actually going to drive the adoption of peer-to-peer -peer approaches, as well as peer-to-peer -peer technologies, is that peer-to-peer -peer systems f fail cheaply. Centralized systems don't fail cheaply enough. When you have the entire community having to try something, and if it works, great, but if it doesn't work, oh, it's a catastrophic failure. The costs of failure are too high, and so you don't have the freedom to fail, and so you don't have the freedom to really try. And so my hunch is that peer-to-peer -peer systems, they're huge advantage is that they actually are far more responsive and adaptable in a changing world than centralized systems. And the, the key thing there, and this is core to Holochain, the key thing is if two parties want to communicate in some way, if there's some form of interaction that they've discovered that works for both of them, it only has to work for both of them and they can do that. Mm -hmm. And now you've got some flow of, of interaction, of resources, of, of work being done, let's say. And if it works for me and it works for him, then great, we can keep doing it. If he also wants to try something else, he can. And suddenly there's an ecosystem of interaction happening. Things that he does may affect me, even though I'm not interacting directly. But if it works for him and it works for him and, and our interaction works for me, okay, we can keep doing that. And any of us can try something new. And if it doesn't work, well, we wasted our time. We wasted our effort. We may suffer some, some consequences. But that cost gets borne locally. And, it's in, and the risk is informed by all the accumulated wisdom that that party had built up over time. But if we happen to stumble on something that works, well, we might keep doing it. And somebody else might go, oh, that, that looks pretty good, I'll try it. And then somebody else goes, that looks pretty good, I'll try it. And so when we, when we find things that work, they're able to spread and propagate across the community very broadly. But when we find things that don't work, the costs tend to stay local. And that imbalance between the huge propagation of successes and the very limited propagation of the costs of failure I think is actually the, the reason that we see peer-to-peer -peer as sort of the default organizing principle that underlies almost all natural living systems. Um, and so we're trying to mimic that, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a very interesting uh, point. Um, I would, um, so of course, like the peer-to-peer -peer is very present in the natural world because we, 
we kind of assume that uh, with uh, the hundred millions of uh, years of evolution, uh, it has uh, reached a stable, uh, efficient place. And I think um, what's interesting in what you said is that I think we see the same patterns in um, in the way um, computer science is evolving. Like, I mean, not, not computer science, like our computer digital world. At, at the beginning, it was uh, easier to build centralized systems. Maybe not at the very beginning because of the very first people thought about it, but um, when the rush started, uh, it was easier to get some developers together and uh, tell them what to do and organize a few persons who were creating this uh, centralized software. Um, and it won for some time. Then uh, came the open source movement which distributed the development everywhere. And the way I see uh, the re-emergence of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, technology today is uh, like a step further in the decentralization of um, kind of labor, of the, of the possibilities of trying stuff. It's easier, as you said, to, to try stuff. So it's clearly... Um, is a more efficient way to, to innovate. Where I'm not completely as, uh, as sure about uh, what you said is the point um, that it allows to spread the innovation more efficiently than centralized systems. In a certain way, it, arise, it allows to s anybody to spread the, uh, the innovation, but Facebook, when they update the system, they update it for everybody. So, in the, so yeah. Efficiency, yes. Spread, okay. But I would not say it's like the, the main <laughs> the main advantage. So yeah. so I'll be I'm, I'm going to point out I actually never said the word efficient, mm -hmm. and it was for a reason. Um, in efficiency, we it is sort of the efficiency is put on a pedestal in our culture today, right? When we especially within business or government, they're always talking about trying to come up with more efficient processes or patterns, etc. cetera. Uh, but efficiency is not a characteristic of a system. Efficiency is a characteristic of a system in relation with its environment, right? So it's, it, the question is not, are you efficient? It's, are you efficient in that context? Is it, you know, given these circumstances, do you work well or more effectively than the other things around you. Efficiency, we really get to efficiency as a result of a process of curation, right? We tried some things. These ones didn't work so well. These ones worked better. We started putting less energy into these ones and more energy into these ones. And over time, we become increasingly efficient in the context that we're facing. We actually adapt our body, our behavior, our business processes to suit the context that we've been facing. But when the circumstances shift, we find ourselves really well suited to this context, even though the world has changed. You know, you, you don't want to be the, the world's greatest uh, Walkman tape cassette, you know, portable tape cassette producer today. Right, that you might be great at it. It's not a good business to be in, you know, thanks to streaming services, etc. But nature has a second part of, of the process. So I, the way I think about evolution is that it, it's a confusing word because it actually packs a lot of complexity into one term, and I find it easier to break it into two parts, generation and curation. So generation, we had a bunch of kids, Right? We got some options on the table. There were some tall ones, there were some short ones, there were some skinny ones, there were some not so skinny ones. Curation, it got cold. The skinny ones died, right? And through those, both of those processes, the curation process leads to increasing efficiency relative to the context that you faced. But the generation part gives you enough diversity to have options on the table so that something makes it through. And the key advantage, I believe, is not that that peer-to-peer -peer systems become more efficient. It's actually that they're far more responsive. You're right in that a centralized system, once it makes a decision, is able to go, yes, and push that change to everything in the system. But it's 
applying a singular insight across a range of contexts, whereas what, a, what natural living systems do is they sort of, at each of the edges, with, with each of the peers, they're feeling around and going, is this better, is that better, no. And so you actually end up having a, a responsiveness, a learning, an adaptive capacity that's, that's happening at multiple layers of sense making. I, I think that, this is gonna sound abstract, but I think that the way we think about intelligence today is off. We, we fixate almost exclusively on the extraction of an insight. And I think this comes from the, the history of the scientific method, right? With the scientific method, we're trained to sort of study a system, try to hold everything constant, attempt to pull one little noticing of a relationship between two of the parts of that system and go, aha, you know, I found it, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's, that's a useful thing. It's not that it's not useful at all, but it's limited in terms of what it can deliver. It delivers singular relational insights. Nature does it differently. Nature has parties, you know, grass and cows and forests and water, all dancing together for a long period of time. And it's, it's not working on a single layer of relationship, it's working on layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of relationship. Some of them happening very quickly, some of them moving very slowly, right? Some of them nested within others. Uh, but nature is, through that very different process, is able to discover balances that are regenerative, balances that are, that are reinforcing and mutually beneficial that lead to, you know, in the case of our body, trillions of cells coordinating with one another to produce, you know, words into a microphone, right? It's kind of crazy, but there is no single centralized control point. And for me, the body is a really useful uh, example or, or place to point to. <laughs> I'm a, how many of you have ever surfed? Has anybody here? How many of you have skied? Okay, we've got surfers, any skiers? I would have expected more skiing. Okay, um, so I'm a surfer, and just like many other sports, you don't learn to surf by reading about surfing. You know, you don't learn to dance by, you know, um, writing out the dance steps. You learn by doing, and in part it's because we are a peer-to-peer -peer system. We're a distributed system of cells, and we can have some intention, but our ability to sort of force our body to do what we want it to is pretty limited. It, we, it actually takes practice over time to get the neurological pathways built up, to get the musculature built up in order to do surfing, in order to play an instrument, in order to ski. Um, and when I'm surfing, if I'm, if I'm surfing several days in a row at the same spot on the same board, over time I'll become very in tune. As surfers, we describe it as being in rhythm. If I change a board, <laughs> all of a sudden everything's a little bit off, right? I've built up over time this, at many layers of sense making, this capacity to sense and respond to what the wave is doing change one variable and it's going to take a little time to, to shift. Now, I find surfing to be a really enjoyable pastime, but it's also a really productive one for me. It throws me into a different mental state and I'm able to think about, you know, all this type of stuff and sometimes I figure things out. But when I do that, if I go to this sort of rational place, oh, what are the insights? I'll often find that next time I paddle for a wave, I, I can barely stand up. Right, the, I, the, the, way, the form of information processing shifted from this very parallel, whole body is involved, I'm present in the moment experience to this very almost centralized, rational, I'm trying to do the scientific method, extract an insight thing, and it literally changes my brain and body functioning so that I can no longer surf. Yeah. You just explained that there is a multiple layer, but if I, if I think about a computer, a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, there is 
only a single layer because we have only one one way to communicate in a, in a network. So can we do multiple layer in a computer? Yeah, so I think there's there, there, there's an open question within there for me, but I'll get to that in just a second. Um, I'll start with computers and computer networks are all today using electromagnetic um, signals, right? So that's the, I'll, I'll frame it as like the lowest level uh, signal, a form of information. So I, I have this theory that information is always in form. It's embodied in some form. So right now we're using sound waves, right? And you're only able to experience information when you experience transformation. So the fact that you have an eardrum and your eardrum flexes when those sound, wave hits it, sound waves hit it, that enables you to notice oh, somebody said something, right? So you have to actually have a, a receptive capacity in order to receive information of a particular form. I'm really good with sound waves, I'm terrible with electromagnetic radiation, right? So um, radio waves, not so good. There might be classical music, there could be classic rock, I have no idea, you know, it could be talk radio, I don't know. My body doesn't pick up on that so well, right? Uh, this com kind of comes back to the identity stuff, right? It's who are you to me? It's what's the, what is the information that I'm capable of receiving or noticing? So, so there is, hey, do you have a, a bare bones capacity to receive that kind of information? If you do, then you can notice differences. So you can notice if I'm speaking in a monotone voice, if I'm quickening my pace or slowing down, if I'm speaking up and down, right? You're able to notice those differences. Uh, we're using sound here, but we could be doing talking. We could be, uh, we could use that talking to organize ourselves in some other way. So there are, you can layer on top different um, patterns. However, to kind of take your question straight on, I do think there are limits with using electronic media as our medium for trying to build up higher layers of coherence. Um, and, it, but it's a slightly different thing. It, it actually has to do, from my perspective, it has to do with not just uh, like latency. So there's a, how many of you are familiar with the idea that you can't really ha play improv jazz across the globe with one another, right? The, the time that the signal takes to get from one place to another sort of throws off the ability to really respond adequately. So making up music when you're really far apart is hard, if not impossible. Um, and so there's a latency issue, just signal getting somewhere, but I think there's actually another more interesting issue, and that is this, that in physical systems, when you, if I do a bunch of push-ups, right? My muscles will get bigger. And one of the results of that might be that now my shirt doesn't fit. <laughs> you know, it could also be that I can do push-ups easier, but there are these, there are these adjacent dimensions of difference that accumulate that we weren't anticipating, that we weren't necessarily paying attention to. And so the, the, the thing that, that I think may, there may be a nugget of interesting stuff to dive into in the area that you just touched on is when we're sensing electronically, whether we're using a camera or a microphone or a temperature gauge, we are selectively sensing and then transmitting a, a symbol representation of that. But it's only those, uh, those forms that we had thought to sort of inquire about that, that are being communicated. And I don't know to what extent the adjacent dimensions of difference um, will get lost. And so we may have not an inability, but a decreased ability to build coherence in, the, in ways that mimic what physical systems are, are capable of. I hope that wasn't too abstract. Um, is there anybody else who's interested in joining, has, asking a question, making a comment? 
PJ, you're in the holochain world. Yeah, come on up. No, but behind you, behind you. She'll, she'll join. You're, you're going to be on call later. If, if either of you are, are good, you're welcome to walk. If you've got another question, bring it up or a comment. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to um, touch upon a point on uh, identities, so multiple identities. Um, I think I understood, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the solution of Holochain enables to have one central point where you have all your identity and you have control over this, and then you can choose which part of your identity you want to share with different providers. Is that right or not? Is no, not, right? not exactly. Not exactly. That, that's, okay. that's a promise that lots of folks make. Okay. You know, we will be your one thing. Um, and that's actually not how we think about identity. Um, okay. We are creating some tools that make it easier for you to um, control your account from multiple devices, mm -hmm. uh, that make it easier, hey, if I lost my phone or I forgot my password, you know, how can I reestablish control over that account? Uh, but we don't, one, we're not dictating the one right way to do that. We, we think that there's a variety of patterns that people will want to make use of. But, but secondly, this idea of, uh, of identity as being an ownership thing, I think gets it wrong because, you know, we're having a conversation right now, right? And these people are hearing us, okay? I'm not able to later go, the, the, this is the ownership identity uh, thing. Um, I'm not able, able to go and erase his memory. <laughs> you know, if I say something stupid on stage, I'm not able to later go and, you know, forget that. That's not how the world works. It was written in him, on him. So there's, there's that side of when signals go out into the world, they're out there and people are gonna do what they do with them. But to your question, it's really, what is he willing to rely upon? When you, sh when you sign into an application, what is it that he requires to feel confident that you are who you say you are, that you're the, the girl who went to you know, this university or has that job or, or should be in control of this bank account. Um, and that's not, a, that's not a thing that we're trying to solve at a holochain layer. We're trying to build the tools that enable you all to come to a level where he goes, no, I need more from you than that. <laughs> and you go, okay, well, here's my photograph. Here's, uh, here's his statement that says, yes, I'm the same person. And at some point, if, if, if he or his institution says, yep, that's good enough for us, then you're able to interact in that way. But it's, a, it's always in the relationship. It's, n it's never a, a sort of a, a one solution to solve them all kind of pattern. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, you, it's not the the goal of uh, Holochain to to solve the the identity pr the identity problem, but especially the the peer to peer approach to ident identity, uh, divorced from the ownership of, of identity, as you said, is uh, is pretty interesting to me because the the way uh, like the the best the most intuitive way to to, to verify if this person is really the, the one who went to the school and uh, something and something and something. Uh, today is uh, using one document like uh, that you, you get with a stamp and you need to trust the stamp and something like this. It's always a, a question of trust and trust in institutions uh, and uh, not secure uh, technology. Uh, whereas with, with a, a cryptographically secure peer-to-peer -peer system, uh, I can ask um, like uh, people who know her, you know, and if I know them and I have uh, some relationship with them, I can distribute the trust in uh, in uh, in this identification. Uh, she can choose uh, if she wants to share this information uh, with me or not. And so I think the, the distribution distributed system uh, do bring a, a very interesting take 
on, on this idea of identity, and I agree with you, it's not, it's not the, the Facebook way of, of doing things, like you have one password, we stored it, and we trust, like, this little thing represents you. What, what represents you is really all the interactions that you had with, with others. So uh, that, that's what... Uh. Yeah, and, and I'll just add one comment, because it's... Um, this is a common conversation in the you know blockchain kind of crypto world. Uh, it, it it always does come down to trust, right? But trust is really all about what's good enough. Is it good enough, right? <laughs> like we you know I drive, and when I'm driving here, I'm driving on the right side of the road because you're supposed to drive on the right side of the road here. I think in 20 years even, people are going to look back and go, they were crazy. You know, they thought that painting some lines on the road would keep them safe. But it's good enough. Right? I'm able to generally get where I'm trying to go just because everybody sort of agrees, yeah, I'm going to drive on the right, you're going to drive on the right. Hey, we're not going to hit one another. Um, the crypto stuff is similar. So even with cryptography, people have said things, you know, they've made statements, etc., if somebody steals her phone and shows up and they've got the signing key, they could impersonate her. In One that. person. And, uh, you know, uh, right. but, you, but in a distributed system, you would have to, to get a lot of phones to, to, to make a, st a statement. It gets robustness uh, but, to, to the system. I'm, I'm not pushing back against that, but what I'm, what I'm pointing out is the, the, there, there, there are going to be failures. Somebody steals my phone. You, these other people have said things about me, and then I go and sign some statement. Hey, I want to withdraw some money, right? All the things that they said about me to, to the party that I'm interacting with, it looks like they said it about the, whoever's controlling that key. And if somebody else is now controlling that key, they get to, act, they get to wield all those, those statements that have been made. Now, if in order for this person to feel comfortable, they're going to check, hey, has this key been reported stolen <laughs> or compromised in some way? We're working on systems to make that easier, right? So, but that's only once a party notices that there's an issue. They may also say, hey, I, I'm interested in the key, but I also need to see a photograph. You know, I, I want to see signed stuff from you from a while ago, you know, a signed image, so you used that key a long time ago, it's got an image. Now show me what you look like now. Do you really want to do this? Yes. And we see this in many of our systems today. It's not that, it's not that cryptography isn't useful. It's incredibly useful. We're using it for that reason. But it, it's not a fix-all. Uh, that trust is always a social process. It's always a social issue. And, and the particulars of our interaction are going to determine how much effort we require from one another in order to feel comfortable taking the particular risk that we're going to take. So if I'm just trying to send a heart emoji, you know, hey, here's a heart emoji. Eh. If, you know, if that goes astray and it, and it lands over here instead of over there, it's probably not the end of the world. If I'm trying to send a nuclear missile and I accidentally send that wrong, oh, that's, that's a problem. We're going to set up very different systems for authorizing particular um, actions depending on the context. It won't be a one-size-fits-all. Um, and cryptography may be a part of both of those, but you're going to have, you're going to layer additional steps on top, I believe. Um, other thoughts or questions? No, I, I was just uh, thinking about, um, so the real, the real issue and the real effort that you have to make is actually security of the information. Because you, as you pointed out, it's all about trust and like which uh, which uh, party is trusting which other party. But the real question is how do you securize the information that is being um, in a transaction, basically? So it's funny, like we're you know we're talking about this tech stuff, right? But I think that when you if you want to see how is all this going to shake out, look at families. And look at your, your community back home in, a in the neighborhood you grew up in, right? When you think about how people learn about one another and make assessments about who to interact with and who not to, um, those sorts of 
you know, I talked with you, you told me some things, I decided, oh man, I'm not gonna date her, <laughs> right? Or uh, I'm not gonna let him date my sister. Those sorts of things are the sort of mushy, fluid social patterns that are actually are, we look at them as if they're problematic because they're not clean and scientific, but they're actually really rich and they enable very good or good enough sense making. Um, and I think we're gonna see that in this. In the digital context, I think what we'll do is we will start to see similar patterns, but that function not just at the very local scale. We start being able to make use of similar things at larger scales. And the stuff that the cryptography is really useful for is in automatically verifying. This party said, said this about these guys, they said this about this person, they said this about this person, they said this about this person. I know these guys. I don't know any of these folks, but that's a good enough trust chain. And I don't have any indications that there was like a stolen phone along the way or whatever. Yeah, sounds great. But uh, uh, even more than the chain, I would say that what's interesting with the peer-to-peer -peer approach is uh, that it's a web. And so uh, if there's uh, like uh, a phone that was stolen, um, maybe for one hour or two hours, it will not be declared, but a posteriori it will. It will, and it will make a, a hole in the, in, the, in the system that allows you to detect what uh, truth is good enough for you. You know, that's uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I think that one of the, if we look back at natural systems, right, natural living systems, one of the things that you see is they're not afraid of failure. Like failures are okay. We can have small failures. Um, the question is, are we, when, when there is a failure, are we able to respond? And, and some of the things I think we'll see are uh, not just, ah, oh, that sucked, you know, that hour of transactions that he didn't notice that he's gonna get burned there. We may actually see things, I'd say replacements to existing monetary type systems where parties actually refuse to honor purchases or you know, transactions that were done on a device that later was declared as stolen, right? They go, uh, no, I don't want to, I don't want to reward the people who defrauded that party. Um, we may see things like that. I don't, you know, I, I think that's, that's a ways out still, but. Um, all right, so I, I had promised to make some predictions. How am I doing on time so far? 10 minutes? Okay, great. Um, so my hunch is that the, the main point for, for you know, the talk that I was making is that peer-to-peer -peer systems have a huge learning advantage over centralized systems. Uh, with Holochain, we, without going into too much technical detail, all it takes for two or more parties to run an application is that they agree to run that application. And that, in, that application includes within it the rules that could include rules like we're doing 140 character tweets, or it could include rules like you have to have a photograph, you know, somebody else has to have vouched for you or met you in person, or it depends on the app. But those are the rules that, that we each go, yep, that works for me, I'll make use of that. Now our hunch is that, and we're, we're not, it's not just a hunch, we're trying to make this very common as a practice, uh, we're not gonna see Facebook style apps, meaning we're not gonna see one big singular application where people join that app. We're gonna see lots of micro applications that people cobble together. So I'm able to speak with you in this way and in this other way and this other way. So we've got chat and we have video and we have you know, identity stuff and I can send you money, but each of those is essentially a different channel but I can see them all as, as one user interface. I'm not having to jump back and forth between them. From my perspective, it's a single app, even though nobody else is using that exact same configuration of micro applications. And so that, we think, is going to make it easier for people to try stuff out and go, well, you know, you and me want to try something new, even though nobody else is interested in it. Well, let's try that. And if it works, for us, we can keep using it. And if other people get interested, they can start making use of it as well. Um, 
my hunch is that the communities that start making use of those patterns, and actually the one gentleman who was up on the stage earlier, he mentioned trying to build on rust and it's not the easiest thing yet. Uh, PJ can probably speak to that too. He's one of our core developers. Um, uh, early days, Holochain is for developers. It's for software developers and it's not the easiest thing to build on. We're hoping over the next six months to year that that starts to get easier and easier and within a few years, I could see, similar to the World Wide Web, things getting very easy for people to, to build or, or copy and paste and modify an application and, and get try something new. Um, as that difficulty goes down, I think we're gonna see lots of people doing something that's not really available to us today, which is noticing that the system you're using sucks and actually being able to do something about it, right? Like our internet applications today sort of um, have no dignity. <laughs> you know, they don't give us any dignity, right? It's sort of like, you don't like it? Tough, right? Uh, but I think that in this new landscape that Holochain will be a part of, when people go, ooh, I don't like how that works, they're gonna be able to go, well, let's try something different. And if the thing that they try works for them, they'll be able to, to use it. and. And those communities will actually be far more nimble, far more responsive to the changing context that they face than the centralized systems, but also the centralized organizations. I think we will see a, a big shift in how humans coordinate more generally. Right now, much of our coordination is done through corporations uh, or governments. And um, it's not that those are evil things, but they're pretty pretty poor at, at responding um, to a, a shifting world. Yeah, yeah so uh, I agree with uh, something you said uh, if, like a few minutes ago, uh, that uh, it's very good that we have the technology that you're building, you know, that will allow it, but it's not the technology that will solve this problem. In the same way, today we have, uh, we have Linux uh, on which, uh, which people can use uh, and adapt it to the, 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 the way of doing it doing things and okay it's maybe not super easy you know to to use linux but it's not because it's hard it's a little bit hard that people don't you don't use it this much it's because we we're, we're not really educated uh, or, or the there's not a social drive you know towards this the this way of thinking so uh, the technology is great and as you said like it's there's a, a mentality shift that also needs to happen and that's what I was talking about, the, like the ownership in the, the, the agency in the large sense of the word is yet to take, to take uh, this, this data and adapt it and, and these ways of interacting with the system and adapt it to, to, your, uh, to, to your, your way of thinking. So I, if you're hopeful uh, about this, uh, hope you're optimistic about it, that's, that's a good news. But <laughs> I am. And I want to just for the last couple of minutes, if we've got the time still. Uh, anybody who didn't want to come up on stage, can we get some questions in the audience? Is there any questions or comments or, you know, this is bullshit, man. <laughs> any hands? There we go. So can we have a P2P society with a centralized political system? So that's one question. and. Uh, the other one, you know, uh, sci-fi movies are selling us a dystopian view of the future with alienated people. So if I want to be free in the future, should I learn to be a developer with hello, whatever? I hope it doesn't <laughs> require that. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I'll start with the first question. Um, you know, can, can we, essentially, can we, can we do peer-to-peer -peer society with centralized government? Um, I don't think we need to tear down the existing governmental institutions. Uh, you know, as imperfect as they are, they're still really useful. My hunch is, as alternative methods of solving particular problems uh, mature, when they get good enough to actually address the kinds of coordination challenges that we currently make use of some particular institution to address, well, then we will feel a lot less 
wedded to that institution and, and it will lose political support, right? The support for, I don't know, uh, it could be, it could be even be street maintenance. You know, we may find other ways of doing street maintenance that are more effective, more responsive. We get it done faster. The people who do it get recognized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we go, you know what? Let's stop using tax dollars routed through a particular bureaucracy to solve that problem. Uh, but I think that's going to be a, a lived process. And then in terms of the, the do I have to become a developer? Um, gosh, I hope not. You know, I, I think early, early days, the people who are building Holochain applications themselves, um, at least the early ones, they're going to be developers. My hope is over time, people build layers on top that similar to, you know, I think there's wet Wix or WordPress, right? There are these things today where, you know, learning to build a website was a little complicated and then people came along and built layers that simplified or abstracted away some of the complexity. And I, I'm hopeful that we'll see similar things in the Holochain ecosystem. Uh, one last question or comment. Back to the well. So, yeah. sorry for monopolizing. Well, we've seen, uh, you know, flimsy applications with a billion dollar of marketing that uh, made it big. Whereas we've seen uh, great applications without marketing that are not being successful. So how do you expect uh, P2P applications to pull through, basically, in this environment of VC-funded, you know, uh, VC-driven world? Yeah, so for those who aren't familiar with the jargon, VC is venture capital. Uh, and venture capitalists basically finance early stage companies and they take a, a portion of the ownership. And the dominant theory today is that in a new emerging category, there's going to be one you know, king that kind of owns all. And so they, they tend to sort of throw huge amounts of capital at a project to try to help it gain widespread penetration and domination early on. Um, there's been a trend in the computer software world over the last 20 years of, it re of requiring less and less capital to get things off the ground and get to you know, unicorn, you know, billion dollar valuation, whatever, et cetera. Um, and and I, I see that continuing. I don't, I actually think that there are going to be software applications that, that, that have wonderfully profitable business models. I also think there are gonna be software applications that have no business model, that are basically community-driven projects that, that gain huge traction as well. Um, the key, again, is does it solve a real problem? Does it solve a pain that people are experiencing now, um, and they, they need, they feel viscerally that they need to solve. Um, I don't, if billion dollar marketing budgets were the key, then big companies would be known for innovation. They aren't, <laughs> right? It's, it's, the, it's the small um, startups who are typically willing to try things at the edges, um, and, and they stumble upon some pattern, usually some real significant pain that's needing to be solved. Um, and that's, that's the key. I think Holochain in part because it makes it so that you do not have to have a business model in order to run an application. It, it, it's not that you can't have one, but you don't need one. I think it opens up a whole lot of spaces where Currently, there's, no, there's nobody serving that need because there is no venture capital willing to go in because there's not the same pot of gold. Um, and a, a simple example, ride sharing. Ride sharing is a huge, huge business today, but um, carpool ride sharing, not so much, right? Hey, I want to drive somewhere. I want to go in the fast lane. <laughs> I'm willing to have a person or two get in my car. They don't even need to pay me. I just want to not wait in traffic. Nobody's serving that customer base today because there's no money to be made there. But it's not actually a very difficult problem that could have hundreds of millions of customers like that. And even just saying, hey, if you like this service, 
give us a donation could actually result in a, a, a fairly lucrative project for a, a handful of folks to take on. All right, and with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.